Good afternoon, and welcome to the Financial Empowerment Network Virtual Learning Series. Our training today is about financial empowerment integration into service deliveries. The webinar audience is intended for professionals in the field, whom we define as case managers, advocates, and financial counselors, coaches, to guide and contextualize the needs of your clients. I'm Alice with the Financial Empowerment Network. During our time together with my co-facilitators, we will take you into the financial empowerment zone. And you will hear the story of Sophie's 18-month financial empowerment journey. The Financial Empowerment Network envisions communities where low and moderate income individuals, families can achieve financial well-being. Our mission is to advance financial empowerment through partnerships that support access to affordable, effective, and relevant services, products, and other resources. Our process is to serve as a liaison to create connections, disseminate evidence-based and promising practices, and bring resources to a network of providers to integrate financial empowerment into other services, including anti-poverty strategies. With me today is Becky House with American Financial Solutions and Lydia Savia with King County Housing Authority. Uh, and one thing I'd like to note is that both of them are uh, co-chairs of our Financial Empowerment Trainers Task Force, and so um, this is a wonderful collaboration with both of them. Becky is the Education and Housing Communications Director with American Financial Solutions and a Board Director for the Financial Empowerment Network and Bank on Washington Co-Chair. Becky has 24 years of experience in training and education development in nonprofit organizations. She is a certified as a financial educator through the National Foundation for Credit Counseling and was named their 2019 Financial Educator of the Year. Becky is also an expert advisor for media outlets such as US News and World Report, ABC, CBS, and Money Magazine. Lydia Savia Dawson has worked at King County Housing Authority as the Family Self Coordinator for the past 10 years. She has also worked as needed as a financial education facilitator and coach for the YWCA's Economic Resilience Initiative where she works primarily with survivors of domestic violence. Lydia has 25 years of experience in human resources and human services in a variety of settings, including city government, nonprofit agencies, and the housing authority. In addition, Lydia serves on the city, of, city council for the city of Federal Way. So thank you so much, Becky and Lydia, for joining me today to facilitate this training. And again, welcome everyone. Becky, I'd love to hear a little bit more from you on American Financial Solutions. Well, thank you, Alice. Thanks for that introduction, too. I sound like a superstar. Um, uh, as you said, I work with American Financial Solutions. We are a division of North Seattle Community College Foundation. And um, what we do, we provide uh, financial education services. We provide credit counseling services, help people manage budgets, uh, work their way out of debt. We do pre- and post-bankruptcy counseling we also help people who may be facing foreclosure or unable to make their mortgage payments. Um, we help with student loans and we also do pre-purchase housing counseling and can help people with their applications for um, people who are low income or very low income with applications for housing loans through the USDA. Um, so that's, that's really what we do in a nutshell. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to Lydia. Thank you, Becky. Uh, Good afternoon. As Alice said, my name is Lydia Asafra Dawson, and I am honored to be co-facilitating this workshop with these two experts who I look to for information, resources, as well as services for the clients I work with. So just want to take this opportunity to thank you, um, both Becky and Alice. Um, King County Housing Authority provides rental housing assistance to over 55,000 individuals through Section 8 vouchers, public housing, and project-based uh, vouchers, and other programs also. As our tagline says, um, one of the ways we transform lives is through self-sufficiency. And so to that end, I am a part of the Workforce Development Division, which includes the Family Self-Sufficiency 
career development and financial education. So I believe we play a huge role at KCHA to support our um, clients who are in need of especially um, career development and to make sure that they are employed and that they are supported during, on that journey. Um, next slide, please. So today, the purpose of um, the training is to offer an overview of financial empowerment and the resources available to, um, to provide you. And so a definition of financial empowerment, why it matters and resources that can assist in improving your client's economic well-being, um, financial security strategies, and the identification of resources to address um, cash flow shortfalls, and also knowledge of the benefits of a cash flow budget for aligning expenses and of the Your Money, Your Goals financial empowerment tool assisting in income um, preservation found in modules three, four, and five. And just to give you um, an overview, module three in the um, toolkit is tracking and managing income and benefits. Module four is paying bills and your expenses. And module five is getting through the month. Um, as we talk about SOFI, you'll see how these modules help form our approach um, and support of SOFI. Next slide. So here are um, resources that you received prior to and in preparation for this webinar. And so you'll also uh, be receiving this as a follow-up after we're done with this um, um, webinar. So um, these resources, um, so as they're outlined, you will see them. Um, um, if you don't already have them. So I'm not going to go through each resource in detail, so I'll encourage you to go um, to the links and explore them for yourself. Um, however, I would like to, hold on, I'm sorry. Yeah, so however, I'd like to share that King County Housing Authority, led by our own Jennifer Meisner, our financial education coordinator, is now part of the um, current CFPB's Your Money, Your Goal cohort. Um, you may know Jennifer from her um, work with the Financial Empowerment Network and Bank Con Seattle, King County, before coming to King County Housing Authority, yay, um, where she was a project manager for about seven years and assisted Alice in the development of the training in 2001. Um, interesting to note, this workshop, actually was used by the CFPB in the creation of their Your Money, Your Goal, Your Money, Your Goals uh, toolkit. So I just want to say hooray to Alice and Jennifer for their effort in putting this together, which is now widely being used. So congratulations and thank you. Next slide, please. So um, what is empowerment? Um, as we move along this workshop, we're gonna review the definitions of empowerment and the financial empowerment. So um, find, um, empowerment is the process of increasing your capacity to make choices and transform those choices into actions and desired results. Financial empowerment is building personal knowledge and ability to manage money and use financial service products that work for you. Next slide. And the financial empowerment is when you are financially empowered, you are both informed and skilled. You know where to get help with your financial challenges and can access and choose financial products and services that meet your needs. The sense of empowerment can build confidence that you can effectively use your financial knowledge, skills, and resources to reach your goals. Um, so financial literacy plus skills and confidence to use knowledge equals financial empowerment. So financial, um, being financially literate does not make you financially empowered. Um, I would like to say a lot of times the clients we work with may be financially literate, uh, but may not have the tools to navigate the path to empowerment. As a matter of fact, how many times have you seen where you provide your clients with all the tools and resources and at the next meeting, be it a week later, a day later, however you um, or organize it, they come back to you and come to you with the same questions and not have used the information you had provided them previously. This is where, as their community of support, um, you could help 
um, guide them to bring financial empowerment and make them financially empowered. And so that it's really important that you have the skills and confidence to use that knowledge. And that's where this really comes into play. So our case study, Sophie, is one who is financially literate, but due to circumstances such as situational poverty, disability, and ability to navigate the system, lack of budgeting, and not understanding her expenses, or not knowing that she could ask questions to cut um, or eliminate those expenses. So those all played a huge role in her financial decisions. So with that, I think I give um, this back to Becky. Thank you, Lydia. That was a great, a great segue. Um, and, you know, when you're, when you're working with a client and you're trying to figure out how can I help this person, um, where can we go to bring about that the, the changes that need to come so that they are financially empowered, they, they have the literacy, they understand what's going on so they can move forward. Um, it's, it's determining where do I start? And as Lydia said, a lot of the time we work with clients and they come in and they, um, you know, you go over the information and they go back out and then they come back in and they ask you the same question. It's not an overnight process. We, we know that from working with clients for so long. And Sophie is a perfect example of that. I believe Alice said this is a, an 18 month process that, that she went through in order to really um, understand where she was financially and be able to put herself back on, on track. So we're going to be looking at what you, we need to know, how do we find the information, and then how do we use that information to help Sophie. We can see here uh, her, her budget when uh, she first was seeking assistance, and it's very much out of whack. She had a $1,300 coming in in income, and after her expenses, she had a monthly deficit of $1,600, most of which, again, was that um, housing expense. So... As we move forward to the next slide, um, you know, starting this process, looking at organizing an assessment. Basically, it's just starting the budgeting process. What income is coming in and when is it coming in? How do I identify that? Are there benefits or services that this person um, could, can or could receive that could take the place of some of their expenses and allow them to keep that money for other items in the budget? So, uh, for example, you know, if she's receiving SNAP ben food benefits, is that a substitution? And that's really going to be important as we go through today is, is looking at the idea of substitution um, rather than necessarily just elimination. Um, but what can we substitute that might be less expensive or take the place of the actual dollar amounts that we're spending? So if I get, you know, food benefits that let's say I get $150 in food benefits, that's $150 in cash that I can keep and apply for something else. So it's part of my income. I'm counting those food benefits as income. And then we look at organizing and assessing our finances. Again, it's a great opportunity to review and prioritize bills and debts. One thing that we see people struggle with when it comes to um, expenses are what is the most, what is the most important? So, you know, looking at, do I need this? Do I want this? Is there a less expensive alternative? Am I putting the right things at the top? I need um, to survive, like what needs to be paid and purchased, my rent or my mortgage, my utilities, my medication, you know, my basic food expenses. So those are going to be the top level of my priorities. And sometimes what people will experience is that, you know, they get a uh, a collection bill or, or something like that or an old medical bill that's making a lot of noise and they bump that to the top of the list over their current you know utilities or their current um, rent or or their, even their basic foods so making sure there's a clear understanding that these things really are less important um, in the grand scheme of things then we look at those other uh, financial obligations that are important and can cause issues in a credit, which look at like student loans or auto loans or um, legal obligations. Uh, some of them are very high priority, but at the same time, are there things that you can do to try to mitigate those expenses? Um, and then again, lower priority things like old discontinued services, medical bills and the like. I was talking to somebody this morning who is prioritizing their bills and they have one collection account on their credit report 
um, and they just got their, you know, extra $600 in their unemployment and were working on paying off uh, other bills that they had that are current, which was great. And then they said, well, maybe I should just pay off this one on my, my credit report. And I said, you know, here's the thing. It's already on your credit report. What I would focus on are making sure that these other bills that are hanging out there that are not on the credit report don't end up there. So again, helping people to really walk through that process. Um, and evaluating spending. Again, spending is a big, a big place where we really, you know, can look at uh, what are substitution options. Um, there might be services or expenses that people have no problem eliminating while finances are tight. But on the other hand, uh, during times like this, services like Netflix can be a huge blessing, blessing to a household. Um, but as a substitution example, rather than paying for Netflix, they may be able to use the library's canopy uh, video services to watch movies or watch shows. I did a kind of a spot check um, across the state and it looks like most libraries do offer that service or something that is similar to library card holders. So it's an option and that's just one example. But the goal is to become aware of where the spending is occurring and to look for places that can be reduced or substituted or eliminated. And, it, and again, it's a, it's a step-by-step -step process. So someone's not, they may make a decision while you're talking to them, but they may not implement it until a month down the road because it's getting used to the idea and what am I gonna change? So let's take a look at the next slide. Um, we're gonna look at creating a cash flow budget. So what you're looking at here is the cash flow budget from the CFPB's Your Money, Your Goals Toolkit. This budget is found in module five. And the items we were just talking about, uh, tracking income and expenses and tracking spending can be found in those modules three and four that Lydia mentioned earlier. So for many people, creating a budget means writing down all of their monthly expenses and subtracting those from your uh, monthly income. It's a good way to get a good overview of what's going in and out of the household, but it, it doesn't really tell you if the person is able to meet their obligations in an efficient and a cost-effective manner. So here's what I mean. Let's say that someone receives their paycheck of $800 on the first of the month, but also due on the first of the month is rent of $960, a utility bill of $100, and they need to pay for medication that's $50. That means they're already negative $260. So this person's, you know, now they've got to make a tough decision and maybe they say, I'm going to push the utility payment to next week. So they have the money to get their medicine or they decide to pay the rent a week late, even though they know they'll get a late fee or worst case scenario here, uh, potentially they decide, hey, I'm going to seek assistance from a payday loan company. Um, and no, you know, no matter how you look at it, the cash flow is off. So for that week, there's no money left for food, there's no money left for gas, um, or any other important expenses. So the next slide, it kind of illustrates this in a, well, well, this is why it's such a, uh, cash flow is such a, a, the cash flow budget, I'm sorry, is such a critical tool because it allows you to see the full month in view and determine how much money has to be set aside in order to meet financial obligations when they're due on a week by week basis. Um, so this slide does illustrate that kind of in a condensed manner. So what we see in that first week, if you, you see at the top of week one, the person starts with a balance of $250. Now that's been carried over from the previous month. Then they receive um, a total income of $400, so $300 plus $100. Um, so now their total income for that week is $650, the $250 they started with and $400. After they meet their weekly expenses, they had $400 to carry over to the next week, which, you know, this continues weekly and it helps people to accurately allot their income. You know, where am I going to put it throughout the month and how am I going to be able to meet those obligations when they're due? Then if we look um, at the, the next slide, um, you know, it shows a kind of here's a uh, the, the way that we can cover short weeks, you know, so asking the creditor or the service provider to move payment dates that probably rent is going to be a difficult one. You know, the, the, whoever that you have to pay for the rent is not going to want to move the, the rental date. Maybe they do have a great landlord who knows. Um, but my electric company might be willing to move my electric bill 
or, you know, my credit card company might be able to move that, that payment due date. My student loan company, student loan companies are usually pretty good about being able to move payment dates. Um, so it could be a one-time thing that this person's asking for, or it could be a, a permanent request. But making it, you know, again, the idea is to work on using the, the, this cash flow budget so that you can see where you have to hit those, those bill due dates and where you're going to have to have uh, enough money remaining in order to fit that um, what's due during that week. So I'm going to hand it back over to Alice now to introduce us to Sophie and a great way to discover resources so that we don't have to be experts in everything. Yeah, thanks so much, Becky. You're absolutely right. We can't be an expert in everything. I mean, it's it's not possible. And so one of the things um, I want to stress is Sophie is actually a real person. These numbers are real. Um, and uh, it's somebody that I actually worked with for, it's it's been two years. And I emphasize the two years because, you know, you don't see the results, and you'll see them at the end of this presentation, um, it's pretty remarkable. And I think everybody will agree with that, that when you see the numbers, I mean, she's pretty dire with a, a 1600 uh, deficit at the end of each month. And we can see a big portion of that is housing. And I'm going to save the housing and address that uh, with Lydia, and she'll go over that here later. But one of the things that I want to talk about is the website. We have a website at the financial empowerment network.org. We've had it up for, you know, a number of years. And I, it's really a resource a repository. It's not meant to be pretty or fancy. It's about information. What is it you need to know? And it's the starting point. It's not the end point. And so looking at how that you can use that. So when you look at Sophie, one of the things that, you know, first uh, is health resources. So as you look at her health care, she has Medicare Part B. Um, she is also on SSDI. So she didn't start with Medicare. She was on a two-year waiting period, starting with Medicaid, and then then went to Medicare. And so if you look, you know that, wow, she's underinsured. And given her income of uh, $1,333 a month, uh, is there an option for any subsidy? What can we do to help with that payment for the Medicare Part B? So by using the website and going to health resources, you can identify maybe there's some things that we could be doing for her that she doesn't know uh, to tap into and kind of give her a nudge to help her navigate um, along the way. The other thing that you might look at is financial resources. So again, we have said you can't do this alone. And so when I took on helping Sophie, I, I actually had a team that came together. I definitely don't have all the answers. And so it was a team or a collaborative approach that I reached out to. The first thing I did is I referred to, to her, a financial counselor uh, to be able to help. The financial counselor was also a benefit planner. And I think that is also really critical to help somebody who's on SSI or SSDI uh, to be able to understand the asset and income income limits that uh, are applicable uh, for this individual. And they may be receiving multiple benefits. And so looking at the asset and, lim asset and income limits for each of the benefits is really uh, critical so that you know, they don't have an overpayment um, of any kind. The other thing that um, was important to look at was the disability resources and what's out there, what's available, who can, uh, who could I contact and uh, to be able to find more information and to help give her a nudge, but also to help educate me and making sure that I provided her with cred credible resources and information. So using the website under community resources, uh, you know, another one that I might have tapped into, but I didn't was the entrepreneur resources. Um, you can see there's the cottage industry or part time work. Um, that's definitely also true when we look at, you know, any kind of workforce. Um, and, you know, my first when I first started working with Sophie, one of the things I thought, well, why she could be working. Uh, but as I, I worked with her, and, and when I say work with her, I wasn't the financial counselor. I might say that I was like the coach or the, the person that was kind of 
bringing all the people together. So, you know, making sure she connected with a benefit planner, making sure she uh, was meeting with a financial counselor, making sure that she was tapping into, you know, uh, utility assistance and other resources that were out there that she might have missed. And so, but as I continued to work with her, I realized that, hmm, workforce, uh, going back uh, to work, probably was not an option given her disability. And so uh, we, we didn't go that way, or that, that way but, um, but I'll address that too a little bit along the way here. The other thing is looking at housing. So Lydia mentioned housing and she's gonna address that later on. But on the uh, website, you'll see homeownership foreclosure and then also rental. I think it's important to note that with a lot of folks that we're dealing with today, uh, they're out of work and they're you know, looking at uh, struggling with paying rent, but also struggling to uh, pay their mortgage. Uh, we've heard a lot about on the news about forbearance, uh, but making sure that when we're working with folks that have a mortgage, that they're, they're definitely seeking the uh, assistance of a housing counselor. And a housing counselor may be a financial counselor uh, or they may not. So uh, looking for somebody that is a HUD certified finance, uh, housing counselor. And you can find that information by going to the website here and being referred to the HUD website where you can get a list of uh, housing counselors. American Financial Solutions, for example, is a HUD uh, certified financial counseling agency and have HUD certified counselors to be able to assist with that. Um, so that is uh, one area to really look at. Uh, the other one that we uh, also looked at was looking at uh, the banking and, and how she was accessing banking. And again, here's a link too that will give you financial education information as well as um, a list of financial counselors that are doing the work in the area. So to be able to tap into those resources. So this is my favorite slide because it kind of, you know, when I don't know about you, but when you go to the grocery store, you're finding some empty shelves and I'm looking at maybe putting together a recipe and I'm going, okay, they don't have that. What can I substitute? And so I quickly look up online, what is a substitute for a specific ingredient? But I think this is also true when we're looking at budgeting. Uh, yeah, I always have hated the word budgeting, but I, I think of it more as tracking and substituting substituting. And so this is something that when working with Sophie, looking at what are the resources that, what was she spending her money on and what, what could we substitute? And I say substitute, not eliminate, because it's really her choice and making sure that she understands that there are other things out there that she could be getting maybe the same outcome but for less money. So let me give you a, a couple of examples. One was the internet and television. It was $153 a month that uh, she was paying. And so it was recommended and suggested that maybe she look at Comcast Essentials. Comcast Essentials is $9.95 a month. It gives her internet access. And with that, she could do video streaming. For Christmas, she got a fire stick, and then she had a cousin that allowed her to also access Netflix. And as Becky said, Canopy, if you have a, especially in the Seattle King County area, if you have a library card, you can access Canopy. And uh, it looks very similar to Netflix in that you can use your library card to be able to uh, video stream different movies and uh, documentaries that are out there. Uh, another thing that we looked at was utility assistance. Uh, she was able, she didn't even, she wasn't even aware that there was utility assistance and so was able to tap into that and be able to reduce her utilities. The other one, which is uh, pretty glaring was she had an AT&T cell tablet and she was paying for, instead of tapping into a Wi-Fi, she had a data plan on her tablet. And so making the recommendation to cancel that, you know, use Wi-Fi, and then she owed money on the tablet. And so uh, paying that off and um, reducing that expense. And by, you know, reducing the Comcast essentials and, and some of the other things, she was able to um, pay that off. 
Uh, the other thing that I mentioned uh, in the previous slide was her health care. And so she had um, Medicare, and the Medicare was the Part B. So uh, knowing how Medicare works, there's Part A, which is the hospitalization, Part B, which is your, your doctor, and then Part D, which is your prescription. Part C, which you may hear uh, about, is basically uh, a Medicare Advantage program where it brings together A, B, and D under uh, one uh, organization. You have seen probably organizations advertising that. Um, in her case, uh, the Part C was not available. And so because she wasn't living right here in, in the Washington Washington area. So knowing Medicare and the fact that she just had Part B, we know that she's underinsured because she really needs a supplemental. So she needs her Medicare plus a supplemental. And being an individual with a disability, that was critical. What she wasn't aware of, that there was something called a Medicare savings program and she could apply for what's called QI. So she was able to apply for that and with that um, reduce and, and uh, eliminate the 134, which that dollar amount in 2020 went up, but that was the amount at the time when I started with her. Um, she was able to eliminate that and also get extra help. And that's actually the, the term for it. the extra help um, is a, a benefit to um, reduce your prescription charges. So the substitution with just the expenses, you can see, uh, you know, Comcast Essentials is $9.95 a month compared to $153. So you have almost $140, uh, a little over $140 in savings right off the bat. And then you add the $134. So you're almost getting close to $300 and then up here $400. So we were able to reduce just basic expenses by substituting for those uh, five different uh, areas that are listed here. So Lydia um, is going to share with us a little bit about the housing issue and what was going on here with um, Sophie's housing uh, at uh, 1,600 a month. Yes, thank you, Alice. Um, I just want to say how much I appreciate Becky's recommendation about prioritization and using the cash, cash flow budget um, to manage and adjust your payments. And also, um, Alice's emphasis on how to utilize the resources that are available, especially to us um, in this toolkit, and then um, the importance of building a community around the client that you're working with. I think that's really key and critical in trying to help them um, actualize their ability to become successful. Um, and then sometimes um, those resources that can help our clients cut their costs, um, they are readily available, as we heard, uh, but they are really not on their radar. So I believe um, you both touched on um, the importance of really digging deeper and understanding how to help them navigate the system. And so I appreciate that. Um, and also through, through this webinar, um, as again, Allison Becky said, um, Sophie's journey, um, you have a better understanding of how you can guide her through the, through the process in a non-judgmental and compassionate way. Um, and I think sometimes, though, I mean, those are really key to helping people um, get to where they are because um, they already are hard on themselves, right? Because I know I am. Um, as it is true for most of us, um, her highest, Sophia's highest expense and was her housing. Um, and through the help of um, Alice and uh, the community that was around her, she was able to reduce her rent from 1600 to $292. I mean, that is key. That is huge and um, helpful to now her using the funds uh, for other areas as um, are already um, described. Um, because she didn't have the tools or the knowledge, she didn't even know how to look for subsidized housing, for instance. Um, in her case, public housing or Section 8 vouchers were not options um, because of the long wait and or other um, um, obstacles that are in her way. 
Um, but not only that, she probably wouldn't have known that she could have applied to other uh, multiple housing programs and organizations that are available, not only um, housing authorities. Um, and so one good option could even be for her to have applied um, to any housing authority outside an urban area where their wait list is slightly shorter. Um, and so um, it would be outside of the urban area or the area that she wants to live in. Um, and so once housed for a year at other housing authorities, she could transfer to a housing authority of her choice, um, um, potentially if there's um, a voucher or room available. But at least um, that one year allows her to either um, yeah, to transfer her voucher to, to the place that she wants to be. Well, in Sophie's case, she had a case manager who was able to guide her, um, a family member who could help do some of the search. Um, because as we can see, Sophie would sometimes get overwhelmed with details. Um, and so as you look at your uh, client's budget, you can de dig deeper and understand the underlying or other issues that could stop people from moving forward, even if you provide them with the tools. And um, yeah, with that, back to you, Alice. So thanks so much, Lydia. So yeah, one thing I want to say with the housing, and Lydia mentioned she had a family member. And so when we were putting together, um, you know, a, a team, what I often call it is a brain trust, you know, who do you need to, to come together to be able to help move somebody forward or to be able to solve a problem? Who are the folks that you need at the table? And so family members are, you know, sometimes really critical. And in this case, it, it with an individual with a disability. Um, I think it's important to note that she didn't always have this disability. She wasn't always in poverty. She at one time had been a homeowner. So understanding that we're moving people out of poverty, but they can just as easily slip backwards. And so helping people with that forward moving trajectory is, is really critical. And so her family member was really an important part of the team. And so in the case of Sophie, there was not housing readily available. And so one of the things that we looked at is where is housing? And maybe what we need to do is to move her where there is more affordable housing uh, and not a wait list. Um, and so initially what what was done is she was moved to a more rural area. Uh, there was a wait list, but uh, one of the things that her aunt did was every week would go out and say, "Has is there anything available? Is there anything available? And eventually something came up and it was amazing um, how that became really an effective way of just constantly going out and checking. And then once she was in, in housing, she didn't initially have the 292. It was further reduced uh, because she was able to get further subsidy. But there was a, a wait list along the way, nevertheless. But um, the team effort with family members also, and family members and also friends that uh, stepped in to be able to assist. So I want to talk a little bit about the work situation because Sophie um, is an individual with a disability. And so there were some options uh, that we did look at. And one was in, in the state of Washington, we have plan to work. And so it's a benefit planning project. Um, and you have trained community work incentive coordinators who focus on uh, individuals that are getting social security uh, benefits and they provide free services to individuals and organizations. I might say there are also other organizations that are doing that. And so if you're in the Seattle King County area, um, Northwest Access Fund provides, uh, they have a, a full-time uh, financial uh, counselor as well as a certified benefit planner. They also provide assistive technology loans. So that is a, a really a great resource to have, especially the assistive technology uh, loans. And then there's, um, you know, in collaboration is the Ticket to Work Incentives, which is part of the uh, Improvement Act of 1999. Uh, and so looking at making sure that 
when we're thinking about somebody going back to work, that it is done in a way that's really thoughtful of the benefits that they have and the resources that are available to assist somebody in going to back to work. Um, in this case, Sophie, it really was not an option. Uh, she's had uh, her disability is such that she has chronic pain. And so you may see her where she has a really good day, but then when she's having a really bad day, it's just not, um, work is just not an option. And some, some the, the bad days uh, often outnumber the good days. And so um, we, we made the determination that that probably was not something that we wanted to pursue at, at this point. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Becky, who's going to talk to you about, you know, finances in a, a time of crisis. And I would say we are here with COVID-19. And so some thoughts from Becky on how to mitigate that. So the, the interesting thing is that when we look at finances at a time of crisis, it's really, it boils down essentially to the, the basics that we were talking about earlier, you know, making sure that you're organized when you're looking at a budget, making sure that you're organized when you're looking at your expenses that are out there. Um, again, evaluating where can I make adjustments? Where can I make reductions? Where can I make, uh, uh, implement some substitutions? it becomes very, very important. It's always important to stay in contact with your creditor, but it becomes very, very important to, to stay in contact with the creditor um, during times like this. One of the things that, that we see, so in, an, in a normal everyday world, if somebody contacts their creditor about missing a credit card payment and they are not behind, the creditor is gonna say, well, you know, unfortunately we can't do anything to help you right now because you're not behind. But right now, we've turned that on its head. So if someone calls a creditor and says, I can't make my payment, it's critical that they get in touch with that creditor at this point. Because the creditor, um, many of them do have tools in their toolbox to make it so that someone can either have a reduced payment or they can skip a payment. Um, I mean, we just saw Puget Sound Energy, one of the biggest uh, you know, utility companies around our area, uh, come out and say, hey, if you need help, apply for assistance through us now too. So really, really critical to, to get in touch with them. And I'm gonna talk about some credit reporting issues um, as we go through here a little deeper today too. But um, you know, making sure that you're, you're tracking what's going on, that, that the person really knows, you know, how do I stay on top of my bills? How do I stay on top of um, you know, what income's coming in? And especially when it's confusing, if there's someone who's applying for unemployment, uh, you know, and they don't know, you know, when do I get to apply for this, you know, special unemployment programs? What do I have to do to, you know, to trigger the uh, extra $600? Or what do I have to do to get the extra $500 per child in my house? I mean, there's a lot of resources that are around that, that it's important for people to um, understand. Now, I know I'm speaking a lot just about the, our COVID situation now. But again, it's like we we're talking about in, in all situations, helping people to uh, find those resources that are out there. You know, can I direct them to the King County Housing Authority? Can I direct them to the Northwest Asset uh, Fund? I mean, those kinds of things. So if we look at the, the next slide. Um, so Becky, I have a quick question for you sure. before yes. we move on, if I Go could. Ahead. Um, you know, one of the things last month when you did the training on credit, credit scores <clears throat> and debt management, you talked about creating um, and pulling your credit to have a baseline. Yep, I was absolutely. Wondering if, yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. And is now a time that we should really be worrying about credit repair um, and, and maybe a little bit about that too, because you did an amazing job last month for those that... Um, weren't able to attend we do have that recording yeah definitely so that's that is one of the things that I wanted to add to today's talk so I, I will talk about it right now so it is it's it is important and I think it's a great opportunity for people to go yep I want to take a look at my credit report so I have a baseline you know where am I at right now does everything show the way that it should show gives you an opportunity to dispute anything that's that's in there that you know might not be showing correctly um, but again, it does. It gives you a baseline that you can check what's going on in your credit against, you know, six months down the road, a year down the road, um, however. And 
you know, what I was alluding to there just a minute ago when I was talking about staying in contact with your creditors, there are some special rules right now uh, that came uh, via the CARES Act for how creditors report things. So if I do not call my creditor and I don't make a payment, I'm going to be marked as late on my credit report. If I, if I call my creditor and I say, hey, I, you know, I'm not able to make my payment. Is there some kind of arrangement we can work out? And my creditor says, yes, you know, we can do a lower payment or you can skip this payment. So we have an agreement and agreed upon, you know, payment uh, plan going forward. Um, at that point, they're going to have to report the person as current on their credit report. So even if they are able to skip a payment or they're able to make a reduced payment, it's still going to reflect as though they're on time, paying their account on time. So hopefully that's that's making sense. Um, again, they have to contact the creditor though to trigger that. If they just don't make the payment, they they will not get that benefit. They will be marked as you know 30 days late if they hit that 30 days late. Um, for people who are already behind, it will continue to show that they're behind as they go through this this financial situation uh, until they bring it up. So that's not going to change. Um, but you know, if they catch it up, then it will show again that they're on time. So that's, it is, like I said, it's critical to make sure that you stay in touch with your, uh, credit creditors and try to work out an, an agreement or some kind of, um, you know, special, special repayment plan. And I, I also want to say that we're, we are, I, I almost said, finally, I'm not saying finally, but I'm not surprised. We are actually now starting to get the reports of, uh, for those of you who are around in 2008, when we had the housing crisis, of creditors coming through and reducing uh, credit limits. So say someone has a $10,000 credit limit um, and they owe $5,000 on the, the credit card, we're seeing creditors come through and reduce those credit limits to that $5,000 balance, which is certainly causing harm to the credit scores. Um, you know, it, unless the person can pay the amount off within the next 30 days, which most people are right now are certainly not in the position to do that. So your, to your question, Alice, when you say, you know, should people be worrying about credit repair? I mean, it really, and, and managing their credit, we always need to be paying attention to our credit, you know, but as I was saying earlier, if, if someone, if you have an account that's already past due, maybe it's already gone to collections and it's sitting on a credit report, Right now, that's that's not going to be the priority. The priority should be the things that have not gone to collections that are not on a credit report, you know, or at least not negative on a credit report. That's, you know, should be the, the priority for the money that is available. If, you know, if you have plenty of money available that you can start tackling those things, then sure. Well, you know, why wouldn't you? Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks so much, Becky. That was <laughs> actually helpful. And... Um... That's something new, too. So thank you. Sure. Yeah. So um, when we look at debt management plans, and that's one of the things that we do as a credit counseling agency is um, help people to to work their way out of debt. So repaying their debts in full. So in the chapter six of the CFPB's Your Money, Your, Tool, uh, your Goals Toolkit, um, it it talks about addressing debt and we're not going to go into every single option today, but we are going to highlight credit counseling and, and debt management. So what credit counseling agencies like ours can help with, um, you know, many different options for dealing with debt, including developing a usable, you know, sustainable budget, uh, creating action plans for managing debt on, you know, by someone managing their own debt, uh, using a debt management plan and even bankruptcy. Debt management plans, again, they're administered through a credit counseling agency. And on a debt management plan, payments, people make payments on their unsecured debts, like credit cards, collection accounts, personal loans, things like that. So those types of accounts are consolidated into one payment. So the debts themselves are not consolidated. It's not a loan, but the payments are consolidated. That payment's made to the credit counseling agency, who then disperses it to the creditor. Um, I like to describe it as kind of a, a vetting process, basically using a credit counseling is like a vetting process that the person uh, that's using the program is a good candidate for creditor benefits like reducing interest rates, um, reducing payments on the accounts, stopping late fees, uh, things, things like that. 
So what, what, and stopping collection calls. And again, like I was saying, all of the debts are repaid in full. There's no settling of a debt. Um, the biggest benefit is the ability to improve credit because at the same time, you know, you're, you're making on time consistent payments through the program, which are going to the creditors, you're reducing the amount of debt that's owed. So people typically do see improvements in their credit, which is, which is the entire goal there. Um, and to get back on track, the, there are uh, uh, guidelines for, for qualifying. And one of those is that the, the person has to be able to make the payment, you know, so if someone comes and they are, they're talking to us and, you know, like a Sophie situation, I mean, there's going to have to be some other adjustments that go around. Sophie had two credit cards. Um, you know, she had a, a good amount of debt on those credit cards, but the first and foremost, the most important thing was, you know, what, what's going to happen with her housing. And until that's settled, you know, it might just be continuing to make minimum payments on the credit card debt and then ultimately working our way to dealing with that credit card debt. And I hope that um, that makes sense. So if we move to the, the next slide here, this we're, we're taking a look at actually one of the, the plans. It's a debt action plan. And again, this comes out of the CFPB's uh, toolkit. Um, it's a very popular method. A lot of people talk about these uh, to use to get out of debt. So um, it's actually two methods, really. Organizing debt by either, again, organizing is the key here, either the lowest balance to the highest balance or the highest interest rate to the lowest interest rate on an account. So again, this is the debt action plan from the CFPB. And it kind of, it outlines for you the, the pros and the cons of each, each method. If I attack the smallest debt first, you know, I'm probably going to feel like, woohoo, I'm knocking some of these out. And it's a great feeling to get that done, which I have to tell you, in my experience is a huge motivator for people. Um, the highest interest though, is going to save me the most money. If I attack the debts with the highest interest, that's going to, you know, keep more of my money in my pocket ultimately. But again, it's really up to the person and, you know, what do they think is going to work the best for them? Uh, but without looking at that, you know, it's, it's part of that organization, you know, assessing what are my priorities when it comes to any debts that I might have um, and making sure those things we talked about in the very beginning of today, you know, my housing, my utilities, my medication, uh, you know, potentially my car loan or something like that. Those are my top uh, focuses right at this point. Um, and I think that's, that's what I was going to say for now on this one. So here we have uh, a side by side of Sophie's before and after budget. And you can see there have been um, some significant changes. Not all of the expenses have gone down, but, but she's actually coming out ahead now. So if we look at the very bottom on the current side, we can see that she actually has a surplus now of $216 as opposed to that negative $1653. And one of the, uh, the places you can see there is a huge difference. Um, her health, if on the before side, her health care, which was Medicare uh, and prescriptions, between the two of those, she was paying $196. And she did not have dental insurance at that point. If you slide across to the other side on the current, right across from that, healthcare, Medicare, supplemental, and dental. So she's getting both things and she's getting assistance with her um, prescription for $207.11. She didn't, uh, like I said, when her journey started, she didn't have dental coverage. She was only paying for Medicare. So at the same time, um, her prescriptions went down as she qualified for a program literally called Extra Help, you know, and again, this change didn't happen overnight. It took, as Alice said, you know, over 18 months, two years to get to this point, and it wasn't accomplished in a vacuum. She had a team of people, you know, not a, a literal team like we all reach out and touch each other every day, but a, a team of people around the area who worked separately, but all contributed to her success. So I'm going to hand it over to Lydia now to talk about some financial decision making. And you know what, I'm going to jump in before we turn it over to Lydia, if I could, because one of the yeah. things that I will say is when you look at the credit card, credit cards can mm. be really a telling, uh, a 
really tell you uh, something about what's going on financially with an individual. And Definitely. so when you first looked at the credit cards and, you know, she has paid down those credit cards pretty there, you know, one is paid off and the other one has been reduced in half, which is, which is huge. And you Very can see, yeah, and you can see a big part of that is, of course, the reduction in housing, um, you know, the reduction in other expenses, which she used those funds to then pay down debt. But, you know, she was using credit cards, not frivolously. She was using them to live on. She knew she had a cash flow shortage. Uh, she just didn't know how to fix it. And so bringing to people together to be able to assist in uh help her navigate was was really crucial um, but she was living on but there were a couple other things and oftentimes we don't know this until we actually look at the credit card and so one of the things that I I said to Sophie um, is uh, there was a couple things on her credit card that were kind of red flags for me and one was uh, a, a large medical bill and I said to Sophie, what is this? And uh, what was happening during the period of time that she was on Medicaid during that two-year waiting period? The physician that she was seeing, uh, she was on Medicaid. She was paying for a concierge service. So she was being charged $1,400 a year. Well, $1,400 a year is one month, uh, it actually exceeds one month of the income that she's getting from SSDI. And so I, I looked at that and then I looked at uh, some of her medical records that she um, provided and I saw that she was being also charged for services that weren't being provided. And I also saw that there were some other things going on with subscription medicine. And so uh, I contacted with her, uh, her physician, and we disputed the charges and said, um, you know, the, the, the money that was a big $400 that was showing on her credit card when I, I found it. And we disputed that. And one of the things that I was always thankful for was that I remember taking a workshop on medical debt that Julia Kellison here um, facilitated. And we know that when somebody's on SSDI, they can't, you know, they're exempt from garnishment. And so I, I use that as leverage in the discussion with uh, the, the physician and it, it got a little heated, but uh, he agreed that she should not have been charged for those things. Um, but, but things like that, that oftentimes the individual, especially if they're dealing with chronic pain or they have a disability, that they're paying for things that um, they weren't even aware of. Another thing is subscriptions. And so one of the things as I was looking through her credit card, I was saying, um, are you using this? Are you using that? And she wasn't, but it was being charged. And I have to say, I personally have started looking at, you know, my own budget. And I was looking at some of the things that I had subscriptions for. And I'm thinking, well, wow, when's the last time I used that? And yet I'm paying $20 a month. And that can kind of nickel and dime you. And uh, so looking at credit cards, um, instead of just the lump sum, we really looked at what could we cancel on the credit card? What could we dispute? And indefinitely the medical um, you know, that was, a, that was a pretty, um, uh, an incident that shouldn't have occurred, let's say that. And so we were able to resolve that and uh, assist her with uh, finding other financial uh, services. So, um, and at the same time in doing all this, and uh, I appreciate what Becky was saying, is that as we paid things down, our, our concentration, we weren't really focusing on her credit score. We were really focusing on paying down debt. And in doing so, her credit score, of course, has Im improved. It was sort of a byproduct of just paying down debt and taking care of everything else. And so you see the reduction in, in debt, um, but also her credit score improved substantially at the same time. So on that note, I am going to turn it over to Lydia, unless Becky or Lydia, you have anything to add, because, uh, again, this is a 14, almost an 18-month journey that Sophie took. It did not happen overnight. In fact, it couldn't happen overnight, and it didn't happen 
alone. I mean, it really was a, a collaborative effort of friends, family, and then professionals in the field that were able to help navigate um, along the way. Alice? This is Becky. If there's the one thing, if you could just mention uh, one of Sophie's own decisions that she made about the credit card recently, because I think uh, that's really critical. Yeah, uh, actually, I was just, um, I was, I was really, that was like the high spot for me. It was kind of like, yeah, there's a success here. Um, and we were reviewing and looking at her um, because she meets monthly with a financial counselor. And uh, it came up that uh, she had paid a large amount to her on her credit card. And her comment was, yeah, I had some extra money. So I wanted to make sure that I was paying it down. And she goes, and as you know, I'm paying like $60 a month in interest. And so um, I wanted to make sure that I'm able to reduce that. And so that was, That's that huge. was amazing. Um, because she really recognized that, um, and understood that most of her payment was going to interest, not to principal. And it was by paying more that was uh, reducing that and, um, you know, ultimately, uh, what created the surplus versus the deficit. That's it. And it's a perfect example of people, you know, when they first get into the counseling, they they might not necessarily, or, you know, you, you work, start working with them financially, they might not necessarily start, you know, immediately picking up on those habits. But the more you do it, the, the, the more likely it is that they will, you know, it, it starts to become part of their own habits. Yeah, that was pretty amazing. That was wonderful to see that. So that, like I said, that was a big success. And um, I'd also like to add that um, even as you're talking about Sophie right now, I can hear the excitement, Alice. And I think um, as we go along these, they're along with them on this journey and see the milestones that they have um, successfully overcome, I think celebrating with them and, um, and creating that habit of excitement along with them, I think also um, helps because they know that you are totally invested in their, um, have a, a vested interest in their success and that you're really helping them celebrate those successes because they, uh, when you're going through challenges, it's hard to see the light and it's hard to celebrate what little you have accomplished. And so I think I wanted to add that. Yeah, you know what, that's, that's so true. And also, too, in working with Sophie and bringing in the, the team or, you know, the collaborative effort, you know, we're also educating others who in turn can educate others, and it just creates that ripple effect. And so Sophie is able to share her successes and um, provide, you know, a testimonial on on. Uh, how it has benefited her. And so hopefully in, in turn, it's just like that domino effect that she's able to then help somebody else along the way, just as she's been helped. So yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and, and go to the next slide and turn it over to you, Lydia. Sure, thank you. Um, actually, before I go to this, I just wanted to also make one point. Um, as we're talking about building a community around our participants or about, around our clients, one thing that King County Housing Authority and Seattle Housing Authority is doing is we have what's called community of practice where we meet once a quarter. Um, unfortunately, I don't know when our next meeting is going to be, but um, this is a group of nonprofits, um, higher education, um, credit counselors, Korean employment programs, DSHS, uh, workforce development, um, all the different agencies that really, if I need um, someone I, um, to help a client that I'm working with, they are at the table, people who I can rely on and people who I can reach out to to help um, with this na uh, navigate the issues that people are going through. So I think um, I know this uh, webinar um, there are people from all over the place. I think if you don't have that kind of a community that you've already built, um, having that uh, where you come together, not only are you, um, do you have your client's interest at heart, you also support each other 
um, during those conversations that you have at those meetings. So um, just the, um, a shout out or a plug in for something that has worked for us and hopefully will work for you. That said, um, this slide, <clears throat> sorry, um, this is a, a really great tool that the uh, Financial Empowerment Network created. And this is not in the toolkit. Um, it's the financial decision making process. So as we help our clients navigate through financial empowerment, we need to know where they are on this financial spectrum. Um, as Alice calls it, this is the ruler. Um, and so on the spectrum, you can put your client on a scale from one, where they are unbanked, to home ownership and retirement, um, you know, let's say um, 10. So at this point, then, you know, your money starts working for you. So in between those two spectrums uh, of this ruler, there are steps along the way to get you being in control of your finances and where you have achieved financial empowerment. Um, Sophie was clearly in a financial crisis and could not have progressed to becoming homeless without a collaborative approach to, <clears throat> I'm sorry, to intervention. So next slide, please. Thank you. So the, um, so the ruler in this illustration shows how a banking relationship is crucial and how it aligns with previous slides on the movement along the stages of a, fin of a financial continu continue. <coughs> Excuse me. It's the financial decision-making process. And so again, as we help our clients navigate through financial empowerment, we need to know where they are on the financial spectrum. On this spectrum, you can put your client on a scale from one again to um, your 10, right? And so um, <clears throat> it's the knowledge where to find the resources and understanding the financial decision-making process that helps us mitigate the risks of financial crisis. And so uh, with that, Becky, <coughs> excuse me, so I give it back to you. So I have a couple questions here, and I think, Becky, before we move on, I'm just going to have you uh, answer. We have three questions from um, our audience. And so um, the first one is, how would an individual partner with a credit counseling agency, is there a wait list? So there is, uh, no, there's not a wait list. Um, and really, they just need to, to call us, and um, they would be able to work with a counselor, speak to a counselor right away. And that's it. It's pretty straightforward, <laughs> luckily. Yeah. And then the other question is, in, is, in establishing a debt management plan, are individuals required to give account access to all their credit accounts? No, actually, we do not um, get any kind of, well, we do get account numbers because we have to be able to provide those to the creditors to say, this is the account we're talking about and ask for those benefits from the creditors. Um, but as far as like logging into someone's account or anything like that, uh, we don't get any of that information. And actually, we don't, um, a lot of the time people look at, they think that debt management, the way that that works is that we're essentially taking over their accounts. And we, we really try hard to help people understand that they are still 100% responsible. We don't get the statements. So they have to be opening statements. They have to be reviewing them and making sure that, you know, their payments are posting accurately and that their interest rates are reducing and, you know, everything's going the way it's supposed to go. Um, because we get a letter back from the creditor that says, oh, yeah, this is good. We'll give this person this benefits. And then from that point, we think everything's okay. So, which most of the time it is, but that's why we ask people to continue checking their statements, managing your accounts. It's still, you know, we're just kind of, um, like I said earlier, it's like a vetting process saying, yeah, we've re reviewed this person's financial situation and a debt management plan looks like it would be beneficial to them if, you know, it would help reduce the interest rates and reduce the payments and, you know, if they're getting late fees off, that kind of stuff. Um, but if the income's not there, you know, or, or whatever the reason might be, then it's probably not the best option. But that's what we look at. And if it's not the best option, then that's the other side is, okay, what, what, what can we help you do to find another solution? And sometimes, you know, that's 
uh, it is sometimes considering bankruptcy. Sometimes it's just uh, making some budget adjustments. You know, they don't need a debt management plan. They just need to really take a deep look at their budget and um, try to stick to their budget, which sometimes is harder. Uh, or they might need an, an outside referral. Like we do a lot of referrals to Northwest Justice Project for, for things. We deal with a lot of, um, you know, you, you talk about credit cards and I think a lot of people have this kind of assumption that if you have a credit card, you must be, you know, somewhat, you know, well off financially, but 70% of the people that we help and assist are considered low income. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it might be a referral to, you know, other, some other kind of social service agency for assistance or um, there's a huge swath that we kind of, we try to cover there. So Becky, I have a, a question that was recently asked of me, and I know there's a lot of confusion around it currently today um, on housing uh, with rent as well as with mortgage payments. And so the call that I got um, was an interesting call because they asked, should I apply for forbearance? And so my first question to them was, are you having difficulty making your payments? I didn't, you know, one might easily assume that just because somebody thinks they should apply for forbearance that they're having difficulty. And I decided to not make that assumption, but to ask them, tell me a little bit about what's your problem? You know, why are you having problems? Are you having problems? And it was interesting because the response was, no, I'm not having problems making my payment, but felt like maybe I should apply for forbearance. And so I think there's a lot of confusion out there regarding forbearance. Um, there's been a lot in the news, a lot uh, uh, on rent and I, don't, I was wondering, can you talk a little bit about that, especially since uh, American Financial Solutions, you're a HUD certified counseling agency, you have a pretty robust team that works on housing issues. Um, so when somebody, you know, the forbearance and, and the uh, rental, um, what you might advise as, as a counseling agency? So I'm glad you asked that because that's one those are one of the questions that that actually scares me and it does scare me because I am really worried for homeowners especially not just homeowners I get really it is for people who are renting too. The bottom line is if you can afford to make the payment, you know, I, I highly encourage people to make the payment. Um I'm not you know if if you can afford to make any payment, you know, maybe you can uh you do come to an agreement that says, you know, I'm going to pay $500 a month instead of the full amount. But what we don't want to see happen, and which I unfortunately, I feel very confident it is going to happen that we're going to get to the, you know, the end of this, this, this situation we're in right now, and people are going to owe three months, six months worth of mortgage payments or rent payments. Um, and they're going to end up being, you know, homeless or displaced and uh, or facing foreclosure. So you know, it, it is, again, it's fine tuning that budget, really digging in and taking a look at what can be, uh, you know, reduced or removed for the this period of time so that that high priority bill, the mortgage or the rent, whatever it is, does get paid. And that goes for rent too, because I also had a yeah. question where they asked, oh, does this mean we have amnesty for rent? And, um, mm -hmm. So making sure that those, uh, and looking at substitution, which is what you brought up in the very beginning of, uh, you know, the workshop today, um, can be, and just like what I did, looking uh, through my own bills and looking at what kind of subscriptions do I have? When did I last use that subscription and should I eliminate it uh, for the time being? So um, I think that's really, really good tips. And so thank you for that. So. Um, we did have one other question, and the question is, will these slides be available after the webinar? And the answer is that the presentation today um, is being recorded, so you will get the recording of the event uh, following today, and so you will have access to um, everything that we discussed. And uh, for those that weren't able to connect and get on, you'll um, be able to share that link so that they can access it. Okay. Um, before you, we move on, uh, one Sorry. thing I failed to say, um, Alice, you talked about Sophie who 
and she almost <clears throat> she was a homeowner and um now she um as a renter right and so one thing i wanted to i for, um i kind of want to share is that when we're looking at the spectrum the ruler <clears throat> that it's um, important to notice that or to remember that any time on this spectrum, they might be moving forward, but they can also move backwards. Definitely. And so um, I just wanted to make sure that we're um, aware of that and work with it as it, as it comes along, because um, as we celebrate their, their milestones and their successes, we also should be compassionate as if things do fall through and they go backwards, that it's okay. Now let's pick it up let's pick up where we left off and, and move forward. So just wanted to add that. <clears throat> um, so. Yeah, thank you so much. That's, that's so true. Okay, so, um, you know, as we've, we've talked about today, as we've thrown throughout the day, there's really, it's really not just one agency or one person that's really helping someone um, progress along that financial continuum. We're, we're all a team and the, you know, the financial empowerment network that we're talking about is you. It's all of us together. So we have a few uh, moments left. And so I'd love to hear from folks um, that are with us today. You know, what will be useful to you and your path to financial empowerment? What next steps might you take? Um, moreover, what else do you need and then how does change begin with you? So I'd love to hear what, what else do you need out there? Um, and how can we be a benefit? So if you wanna take just a few minutes, if you have um, and reply, and we'll be able to uh, address any questions, but we would lo really look forward to hearing from anybody or any responses you have. To ha you have. So I'll give you a few minutes. Alice, I was just going to say, too, uh, you know, I messed up your questions. I sent you an email, but you might not have seen it yet. Um, somebody asked where you could be uh, and access AFS services. Um, it doesn't matter. In Washington State, you could live anywhere in Washington State and access uh, our services. And we 99% of what we do is done over the phone. Everything we do right now is done over the phone. So. And I might add to that, that you actually have a national presence, even though you True. have your offices in, in Bremerton and right. um, are very, very active within the community um, and partner with a number of organizations presenting, just like you're doing with me today. And so, in fact, as I said, that was one of the reasons why Becky and Lydia were part of our Financial Empowerment Trainers Task Force. And, uh, you know, it's, it's that collaborative approach. You know, Becky has uh, an expertise in, in uh, counseling and housing, but Lydia also has uh, uh, an expertise in housing as well and bringing those resources together. Another person, again, that I would tap into is Megan Greeley at uh, Northwest Access Fund. She is a benefit planner and financial counselor. And so truly, I am not a benefit planner and mm -hmm. uh, having that expertise is really, really critical. Um, having that collaborative approach. So I do have another question um, and it looks like I have a couple more questions. So the question here is, um, oh, increase the collaboration and partnership. You know what? Thank you so much. We're, we're always looking to do that and looking at innovative ways to do that now that we're doing everything virtually. So um, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a challenging one. Um, this information will be helpful as a benefits hub coach, uh, helping college students receive resources, services, referrals, in public benefits, housing, and financial coaching. Thank you. Thank you so much That's for that great. feedback. We really appreciate it. Another question is, how would an individual partner with, um, let's see, I just lost it. How would an individual partner oh, yeah. with a credit counseling agency as a wait list? I think we answered that question. Yeah. Um, my next step is to connect with my clients to discuss uh, identify a financial plan and resources to help them start think about their money and start a savings plan. You know, absolutely. That's great. Um, I think that's a, a great approach and even a little bit uh, is better than nothing. Uh, even if you start with putting a few coins in a money jar. 
Uh, we have another question. Rent is so high, $1,300 yeah. now for a one-bedroom apartment and five to $700 average to rent a room in a house. How can persons who don't qualify for rental assistance survive if housing costs are keeping them in poverty? Um, you know what? That is always a tough question. And, um, you know, one of the things that I would say, you know, many, many years ago, I, I was faced with a, kind of a financial crisis of my own. And I found myself and housing was the issue. I mean, housing is always the number one issue, it seems mm -hmm. where we're not able. And so what I ended up doing to be able to afford keep, uh, to keep a roof over my head was I got a roommate. And I love telling that story because it was a very scary thing for me because I got a roommate, had never met this gal. And to this day, she is my best friend. And we that was over 30 years ago. And so oftentimes, uh, what could be a lemon can become a lemonade. And uh, uh, it it was my rent was too high, I couldn't afford it. And so I got a roommate. And um, it became a uh, just absolutely wonderful. Um, and how lucky I was that that happened. Um, another one was train more staff about this topic. You know, absolutely. We had 100 people that registered for this. It looks like we don't have as many participants as regis uh, that registered. So um, I am always looking. One thing on that note next Tuesday, and for those of you who get our newsletter and are on our listserv, you know that we have another workshop that's coming up next Tuesday. It is COVID-19 and health insurance options. It is being facilitated by Daphne Pye, who is with Public Health, King County, Seattle. And so that is a, a workshop that's coming up. And so you, uh, if you did not receive uh, the registration, let me know and I'll be happy to share it with you. Registration though does fill up really quickly. Um, another question is, how do you recommend one move forward on obtaining certifications as a financial coach? My agency would like me to become certified in some capacity and I see a couple different paths, not, what, not sure which is best. Um, you know, one of the, there's a number of programs. I think one that, um, depending on, uh, you know, the budget for your agency, but AFCPE actually offers two different options. One is a little bit more expensive, and then they have uh, another one as well. So I would look at AFCPE and look at some of the things that they're offering um, as far as financial coaches. Let's see if I've gotten everything. You have one question on forbearance. Now, do you want to go ahead and address that, Becky? Sure. It says, can you say more on the forbearance? People are looking at it as a relief for months. How do we answer questions in that area? It, you know, it, it's a very tough question because I know people are really struggling and trying to make their payments. So the, the idea is that, again, you, you know, if you can make the payments, uh, for your rent or for your mortgage, do it and don't take the forbearance. All the forbearance is really doing, it's giving you a, a period of time where you don't have to make those payments. But at the end of that time, all of those are going to become due. So if I've missed, if my rent is $1,000 a month, at the end of three months, I'm going to owe $3,000 plus the next month's rent. So am I going to have $4,000 to pay that? I mean, in this situation, probably, you know, we're not going to have that. So if there's any way possible to pay the rent or to, to pay the mortgage, I'm, I encourage people to do that. Uh, again, to go through their budgets with a fine tooth comb and see what they can eliminate and what they cannot eliminate. And I 100% I get it that, you know, it, it might just be easier at this point in time to push that problem down the road. Um, but it's, it is a, a scary situation. Uh, you know, there are people that are that are asking our legislators to put in uh, I, uh, 
uh, what's the word, um, policies, rules, whatever, about what will happen at the end of these periods of time um, to give people, a, you know, a grace period to catch up or, you know, be able to divide those payments up over the coming months. I'm sure that some creditors, maybe some landlords or, or you know, not just creditors, but mortgage companies, some landlords, you know, may implement their own programs to do that, but there is no guarantee. So. Yeah, and I would say, you know, uh, to that, it's in really impor important not to, uh, you know, to, to make sure you communicate. So if you have yeah. clients that are in that situation or you're in that situation, uh, you know, communicate with your landlord. Let them know, hey, um, even though, you know, there's uh, a moratorium for eviction at this point, um, you know, you, you don't have to worry about that, but there's still rent ha hanging over your head. So letting your landlord know, hey, I'm having a lot of difficulty now. You know, how could I work this out? So being really transparent, asking for help. And the same thing with your mortgage company, make sh making sure you notify them. And then remember, as Becky said in the beginning, if you're having difficulty making a payment due to COVID-19, making sure that you address that with the creditors. Yeah. Um, and notifying them so that it's not reported and it doesn't become a negative mark on your, your credit report. Um, so making sure you, you do that. Um, did I miss anything on that, Becky? No, I think that's great. Okay. You, it looks like you have one more question. There's another question, so don't miss it. Okay, go for it. In establishing a debt management plan, are individuals required to give account access to all their credit accounts? Um, Becky? Oh, we did answer that one, but the one right oh. underneath of that, is it possible yeah. for a financial coach at our agency to create a debt management plan for clients to work with yeah. creditors? And if so, what's the first step? So, Sorry about that. No, oh, no, it's okay. So for a debt management plan is actually a contract between the debt management company, like or not company, but it's the credit counseling agency, excuse me, um, and the creditor. So it's an agreement that we have. Um, so as another agency, I mean, you could approach those creditors uh, and, you know, say that this is what you're trying to do. You'd like to set yourself up basically as a, you know, a providing credit counseling. Um, as an individual, I mean, there is nothing that stops anybody from being able to contact their creditors and ask for the same basic, um, you know, uh, concessions is what we call them. So, you know, again, reducing the interest rates, stopping late fees, you know, stopping over the limit fees, stopping collection calls, those kinds of things. Um, it's, it is uh, regulated is not the word, it is regulated, but that it's not the word I'm looking for specifically, but um, there's a lot more to it. If I don't, you know, if whoever asked that question wants to contact me directly, they're more than welcome to um, the house at myfinancialgoals.org uh, to kind of roll through that. It's a very complicated question. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I think it is. And also, too, there's limitations on fees that can be charged as well. Um, and so, Definitely. you know, you have to look at... Um, you know, what, what the, the requirements and the legal uh, requirements are around doing that. But yeah, definitely anybody can call and negotiate their own debt. Yep. Uh, but I think for a house or for a counselor, you need to make sure that you have um, and you understand all the, the regulatory process for doing something like that. Um, there was another question, and the question is, can I get registration for training next week? And absolutely you can. Um, if you did not receive my, uh, if you don't receive my monthly newsletters or you don't, uh, didn't receive the training announcement, feel free to email me at a Cody. So that's A is an apple, C-O-D-A-Y at everyoneiswelcome.org, and I would be happy to send that to you. Um, I also will be following up with uh, information, uh, again, for anybody who registered, so not just those that were on the call, but anybody who registered, uh, with the information, the handout uh, the, that you can download, the links that uh, Lydia mentioned, uh, the resource list, and we'll send you those out, as well as the recorded uh, webinar as well and feel free to share that with others so did I miss any questions this is a 
kind of the last call for questions. We're currently pretty much at the hour. So I have time for one last question and then Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I think we uh, have, let's see, it looks like we have one more question that came in. Oh, do we get certification or proof we at, uh, attended this? Um, you know, uh, no, but what you could use is the, the follow-up email that I send out as proof that you attended. Um, I don't have a a process in place where I'm able to uh, offer a certificate at this time. I'm still working through the virtual training process and hopefully uh, here in another few months we'll have it uh, a more formalized process. So, but please do uh, use that if you need something for your supervisor. Again, shoot me an email and I'd be happy to uh, provide you with a, an email or uh, acknowledgement saying that you were on the call. So I think we have um, responded to all the questions. I just want to say thank you, everyone, for attending. Again, we have another webinar coming up next Tuesday on COVID-19 healthcare options. And Daphne Pye is with King County uh, with Public Health, Seattle, King County. Um, she is an amazing resource, and I would say she's somebody everyone should know. Uh, she is uh, manages the King County uh, Exchange, the navigators there, and so she is a wealth of information. So again, thank you so much, everybody, for being with us today. I also want to say thank you to Becky House with American Financial Solutions and Lydia Savia Dawson uh, with King County Public Housing. For more information, feel free to go to uh, www.financialempowermentnetwork.org. Thank you so much again. Stay safe. Have a great day.